Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, January 16th, 2023. And tomorrow in history, we've got a birthday, January 17th. 1706, old school. Benjamin Franklin was born. He was so famous, and he's really still famous today, but he was known as the first American. And while we've all probably heard plenty of quotes that have been attributed to him or that were maybe kind of in use, but he made famous things like no pain, no gain, time is money, death and taxes— But he was much more than just a creative and witty writer on day-to-day things. On this episode, I want to share what I see as my favorite or top 10 to maybe 15 favorite quotes on things like power, government, liberty, peace, empire, and stuff like that. I think it's pretty interesting. It'll be a quick, fun take, but uh, hopefully you guys will find this uh, something to dig in on as well. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for being here. I want to take a quick moment while we wait for people to get notifications to join us in the live stream and say hello to everyone out in the live chat. I really appreciate you being here, and I hope your Monday's off to a good start. There's burning rubber with a William Pitt quote. Pretty cool. Necessity is the plea for every infringement of human freedom. That's actually very true. They always claim it's necessary. Tim Martin in rainy Arizona, like here in Southern California. Kirk Morrison, South Carolina. Larry Clark, R.C. Andrews, good to see you, buddy. Dave Simmons, Liberty Revolutionary. Sharon Patriot, Ryan Korn, Senator D.T., uh, Haji Outlaw, 63, cool screen name, Imperial Guard, and everyone else. There's Joshua Bennett and Mary Catherine. Thank you all for being here. Let's get right to this. I don't want to just kind of go through this uh, through maybe there'll be kind of some categories. But I think what Benjamin Franklin recognizes that people with power would always try to use that power in ways to expand that power. And they would use it to attack and destroy liberty over time. And he talked about this off and on throughout his very, very long career. Here's the first one that I want to get into talking about that here in the Philadelphia Convention, the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787. He said, as all history informs us, there has been in every state and kingdom a constant kind of warfare between the governing and the governed. He didn't think it was just in certain areas or where they had a bad system uh, or where they had bad people rising to the top, but all through history in every state out there, in every country, there's always been people who've wanted to use power And in a way, kind of a warfare against the people, attacking their liberty. And Franklin was a student of history, like so many at the time. And that's why he said in this letter to Jane Mecom in November of 1773, some years earlier, make yourselves sheep and the wolves will eat you. And we are all familiar with the phrase, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. He had proposed that for the great seal of the United States. They decided not to go with it. Thomas Jefferson took it as as his personal seal. I'm going to link to all the original source documents that I'm citing on this one over at Monticello.org talking about Jefferson's seal, his personal seal, and a little bit of history behind this phrase, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. So if you recognize that government The people with power, the governing, are always in a state of some kind of a low-grade warfare. Sometimes it's much more than just a low-grade one, but they're always attacking the liberty of the people. And if you sit there as sheep, they're going to destroy you. Then what is the proper response? Rebellion to tyrants is obedient to God. And he actually talked about this as well at the time of the beginning uh, of the conflict, once the conflict was about to break out, if you think of the date of this, February of 1775, just weeks before Lexington and Concord of that year, here he is in a letter to James Bodoin. I know I'm pronouncing that one wrong. If we tamely give up our rights in this contest, a century to come will not restore us in the opinion of the world. In other words, if you just tamely give up your liberty, and this is something that other founders and old revolutionaries talked about over and over and over in the years leading up to the war for American independence. We know that the American Revolution was far more than the war. It was the change, the radical change in the viewpoints and the sentiments of the people going all the way back to 1761, if we're going to take John Adams's word, and James Otis Jr.'s great speech against the writs of assistance, or if we take the Thomas Jefferson version, basically, uh, the resistance and opposition to the Stamp Act, highlighted heavily by uh, Patrick Henry's 
resolutions in May of 1765. But if you just give up your liberty and if you just uh, comply or as John Dickinson put it in response to the Stamp Act, Compliance establishes the detestable precedent. Government will never give up its own power if they don't have any reason to. If everyone complies with it, if everyone tamely sets aside their liberty for the peace or for whatever there is, whatever the reason is, out of fear, that maybe you don't think you can do anything about it, then, well, you don't deserve respect. You deserve some kind of derision, and Benjamin Franklin expected that. Now, here he is talking about some of the ways that they go after liberty. And here he is as a 16-year-old young man. He didn't write this, but he was filling in as publisher for uh, the New England Current in 1722. He had tried to submit a bunch of letters. His brother was the publisher and editor, but his brother, and he always uh, rejected them. But his brother was in jail. And I'm not sure if his brother actually uh, made provision for Benjamin to take over publishing. But one way or another, we know that for, I don't know, maybe a week and a half or so in 1722, Benjamin Franklin took over publication of that uh, newspaper, the New England Current, and he published this letter. Oh, I'm changing the size for those of you who are watching on video. Let's see if I can get this fixed. Here he is. Whosoever, whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech. So the first thing that they try to do is restrict what you can say, who you can say things about, where you can say, what you can say, things like that. And sometimes it comes from government, sometimes it comes elsewhere. But the less you allow people to speak, the less you are on board with liberty. Now, you don't necessarily want government to come in and fix those problems when they're outside of the government, but that's a different story. Anyways, here he is talking some years later, very similar, in uh, an essay called Apology for Printers in 1731. He said, if all printers were determined not to print anything till they were sure it would offend nobody, there would be very little printed. In other words... If you're going to be honest, honesty often breeds, well, people getting pissed off. (laughs) And if someone isn't offended, you haven't challenged their way of thinking. And Benjamin Franklin recognized this at just, what is he, 24, 25 years of age? I My math skills are terrible. I went to government-run schools. So math, geography, a lot of the basics I struggle with without a computer. But anyways, very young man, here he is recognizing that, you know, if you're going to speak the truth about things, you are going to upset people. And if you're only concerned about whether or not you're offending people, here he is talking about this centuries ago. We think that this is a new issue happening today, but this is something a young Benjamin Franklin recognized all the way back in 1731. And we all know the standard one. And the the old phrase, those who would, there's various versions of this. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. But there's another one that I think is very similar that's a precursor to this one, going all the way back to 1738. That one, I think, was 1755 or so, the original version of it. I didn't actually look it up because I was just using it as an example. But here in Poor Richard's Almanac in 1738, Franklin said, sell not virtue to purchase wealth, nor liberty to purchase power. Just a straight warning about giving up your morals to make advancements in society or giving up liberty to get more power and control. And that's always a dangerous situation for people who love liberty and who believe that good moral people are absolutely, well, the foundation of all of it. He also talked about the power of government welfare programs. And this is an an, uh, essay called On the Price of Corn and the Management of the Poor in 1766. And he recognized what so many people seem to be just incapable of today, that when you make government in charge, you, you give people the social safety net. And, you know, it sounds horrible to say, oh, you got to pull it out from underneath them. And I don't think Benjamin Franklin was talking about that. But what he recognized is that when you create a scenario that people become dependent on government or they can live a comfortable, at least in their their view, a comfortable-ish life doing nothing but living off the government dole, there's no reason for them to change. And this is how Benjamin Franklin put it. He said, you offered a premium for the encouragement of idleness. And you should not now wonder that it has had its effect in the increase 
in poverty. He recognized all the way back then, three centuries ago, well, almost, getting there. I'm, I'm time traveling a little bit here. But so long ago, he recognized that government welfare programs actually made poverty worse. It kept people in po poverty. And I think many people actually love that today. The people who actually understand that and love these government programs for the monster state, they probably like that. They want to keep people as dependent on the state as possible. But so many people who are well-meaning because they've gone through government-run schools, they've been taught from cradle to grave that government uh, so-called solutions are there for every single problem on the face of the earth. They really believe that government is doing the right thing instead of actually harming people who need help. And Mike Meharry did a really nice article on this on my birthday, it looks like, December 1st, 2021. Benjamin Franklin on doing good to the poor. So you're going to do good to the poor. You don't just hand them loot and then let them live off of the handouts. What you do, which encourages more people to do the same, of course, what you do is you help encourage them get out of that scenario so they can stand on their own two feet. It's a really interesting article and a really interesting take on an opposition to big government welfare programs in the middle of the 18th century. So I will link to that article by Meharry over in the show notes, 10th Amendment Center .com slash path to liberty. I published that blog post. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live stream is done. And there you're going to find a section called show notes. And I will link to all the stuff that I keep mentioning. There's also a bunch of other platforms that we post on. Not only do we live stream on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and LinkedIn and Rumble, I believe, Odyssey and Facebook. We also archive our video and audio only podcast edition on almost every platform possible. I know Know we've got to expand to a few others still, uh, but we're out there as many places as possible. In case we happen to be missing from the one that you watch or listen on at some point, you'll be able to find others. That show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Sharon Patriot says, I don't want the government solutions. Yeah, and that's, you know, the, those of us who've decided to learn, to understand, I was raised a good lefty commie. I used to proudly refer to myself as a Marxist. I used to think, I remember thinking of um, the, the airline bailouts, maybe sometime in the 80s. I was like a, a, a young man, teenager at that point. Uh, so maybe 15, 16 years old. I can't remember the year. But my instinctual thought going through government schools where I was taught that government uh, was the solution to everything was, oh, they're bailing out the airlines. Why don't why doesn't the government just own them They're It's basically that they're investing it. Government should own it. And I thought that was a reasonable view. I thought that was logical. And I was smarter than everyone else in the room for suggesting that. And if I mentioned it to somebody, no one thought it was weird either. And looking back on that, I recognize how strange that was, that that was my gut instinct. I'm glad that I worked my way out of it. I probably still have a long way to go. We all do in our learning uh, and our personal growth, but uh, hopefully I'm far away from that one. Now, talking about welfare, of course, welfare is based on using government power to take from some to give to others. It's the Robin Hood version, but it never really plays out in a loving, helpful way. Of course, they use government power and they also use the plight of people who are suffering as a way to expand government power. And some people may have good motives behind that, but many people do not. And we should know this as as all through history, we've been informed by Benjamin Franklin and others that there's a kind of a war between the governing and the governed. But it's not just about welfare. It could be any laws that benefit one group over another. And that's how he put it in 1774. I wasn't actually able to find a, uh, a web link, but there's some books with this one in as well. I'll see what I can do in the show notes to get a link where you can see the original version of it. The ordaining of laws in favor of one part of the nation to the prejudice and oppression of another is certainly the most erroneous and mistaken policy. And I think that's why in his first draft, he was the first one to uh, put together a proposal for Articles of Confederation. This was a year before the Declaration of Independence in 1775. And he had uh, presented and drafted that he used the term general welfare because he felt that government, when they were going to be doing something, they shouldn't be able to 
pick and choose and have laws that were for the certain area, but not for others. Certain groups of people, but not for others. He felt that had to apply equally. Now, Thomas Jefferson, when he saw that draft, he thought the phrase general welfare could was a little too ambiguous. But when we understand the context here, we know what Franklin was trying to do. He was opposed to the idea of laws that favor one part of the people over another. Now, talking about power and expanding power and people with power and human nature, Federalists and Anti-Federalists alike warned us about this over and over and over. Here's Franklin. I think this was also in the Philadelphia Convention. I don't have the date off the top of my head, but he said the executive. He was very concerned about executive power one person having too much power and control to do too much stuff. The more consolidated a government, the less liberty you would have. And he warned that the executive will be always increasing here as elsewhere till it ends in a monarchy. Now, some people might immediately look at that and say, oh, well, I mean, we don't have a hereditary king. We don't have an elective king. But certainly what he was concerned with was less about the hereditary nature, but more about the amount of power. And the executive branch of today, if you think about it, really in many ways has far more power than King George III had. So I think Benjamin Franklin was absolutely correct to warn about that. The other warning that he had, And we might think that because he was a Federalist supporter of the Constitution, that he thought that the Constitution would magically create an environment that would protect the liberty of the people forever. And all you'd have to do is wave that document at the people in power and show them all the limits. Oh, see, look, general welfare, commerce, necessary and proper. This is what the stuff is supposed to mean. And we got to love this and we got to follow these rules. And everyone's going to be living in the land of the free forever. But this is nonsense. And Franklin actually warned us on September 17th, 1787. This is the day now we call Constitution Day. We supposedly celebrate this document. Uh, (laughs) That's another story. But he gave the speech. Well, he didn't actually do it. He wrote it out. It was uh, the speech was given by another person. But he wrote the speech. He was pretty old at the time. And he was basically calling on everyone to support the Constitution, send it to the Continental Congress and then to the states for ratification. But he started out by saying, like, look, there's stuff in this document I don't support. We know he did not like the power of the executive branch, for example. But he's like, uh, that doesn't mean I won't change my mind. You know, I had some sage old man advice in there. Like, I might be just wrong There's some stuff I don't like. There's stuff that I might like in the future. Who knows? But the bottom line is it doesn't matter what we have here. I mean, of course, we want the best possible. I think this is the best we could get with consensus. And it doesn't matter what we put together because over time, the people will become depraved and they're going to demand a despotic government no matter what. And that's what he said. He said this is likely to be well administered for a course of years and can only end in despotism as every other form before it when the people become so depraved, and I'm paraphrasing the latter part of this quote, that that's what they demand. And he certainly called that one as well. And so the idea that, well, you know, the anti-federalists were right, the federalists were wrong, there's some gray area in that, because people who are ardent federalists like Franklin certainly warned that the document couldn't enforce itself. It was good, let's just get things rolling, we're going to have a good man at the helm, he said, that was George Washington, and then over the course of the years, we were going to end in despotism. And today, we live under the largest government in history, and if that is not despotism to the founders and old revolutionaries, I don't know what is. We also have the largest empire in history, and Benjamin Franklin warned us against the power of empires as well. Here in a letter to the Marquise de Lafayette, In May of 1781, this is getting close to the end of the war. There weren't a lot of skirmishes after 1781, and uh, the Treaty of Paris was signed a couple years later. But here's how he put it in 1781. Empires, by pride and folly and extravagance, ruin themselves like individuals. We understand that empires all through history eventually collapse. A lot of times it's through debasing the currency. Uh, That's a pretty popular one. But certainly sooner or later, a government becomes so big, it becomes so unwieldy that it collapses. This is by pride and folly 
and extravagance. And here he is as well, eight days after he personally signed the Treaty of Paris, September 3rd, 1783. So eight days later, on the 11th, the original September 11th, never forget, Josiah Quincy Sr., a letter to him. Benjamin Franklin said there never was a good war or a bad peace. Man, I think that's really powerful stuff. I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope this quick take was educational, more important than anything. I hope you learned something. If you support the work that we're doing, nothing helps us get this kind of stuff out to more and more, but sometimes it's way more in depth. Or if you've been watching our new Friday Nullification Movement news shows, those episodes are somewhere between six and eight minutes, and we're getting the latest news from the Tenth Amendment and Nullification Movement out to more and more people. And nothing helps us do this kind of work more than the financial faith and support of our members. If you got a couple of bucks of that dirty government fiat out there, feel free to throw it out our way. Almost no one, maybe no one, does more with less in support of the Constitution and Liberty than the TAC. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. Let me take a look over at the live chat and see if there's any comments or questions. Um, Comments and questions we can get back to. Sharon says there's some buffering. A lot of times that means you just have to reload uh, the browser or maybe try a different platform. Kirk Morrison says, when I was in high school, I learned that government is the problem. I did not. You are a lucky man. That is, I mean, really, when you think about it, that is, now there are other, there are probably more options for that today than when we were all growing up, or I'm not sure how old everyone is, but certainly not here. R.C. Andrews learned the same thing. So we're lucky to have some people out there who had a strong foundation early on. Over the years, I've met many. Unfortunately, I grew up in an area where we had a um, the mayor actually had an S next to his name for a number of years. And so we learned that government was the solution to pretty much anything. And if you think about it, a government-run school system, a Department of Education, you're telling people that some of the most important things on earth, the education of your children— should be handled by government itself. Just the nature of government-run schools, the public school system, in and of itself is a propaganda to- tool. Sharon Patriot says, it's the abuse of power I cannot tolerate. And in many ways, the founding generation agreed. But they recognize that through human nature, once you give them power, they will always seek to expand that power. So even a greater, if we're going to strike the root, we have to recognize that all power will be abused over time. If you like the people who wield the power today and they do things the way you like it, over time, someone along the line is also going to have that power. And the odds of them also using the power in the way that you like is pretty, pretty low. And they will also try to expand it as well. Anyways, let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, Sharon also says a very interesting thank you so much I appreciate it Judson Crab says I teach this message to my students every day that's incredible and hopefully some of these things that I'm sharing on this show uh, help give you some ideas as well I've had a number of people tell me that that blows my mind that they share some of these episodes or they use it as notes uh, to teach students at various grade levels and I think that's incredible I really appreciate that anyways I hope you guys found this interesting I hope you learned something I hope you had a great weekend or maybe you've got a long weekend this week and it's still going today uh, whatever it may be again 10th amendmentcenter.com slash members is how you support the show. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty is where you find all the episodes. I appreciate you being here, and I will see you next time on Wednesday on the Path to Liberty.